The final approach to ethics that we'll be considering uh, in this uh, course is the uh, four principles approach, um, also known as principalism. Um, but first, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, some basic language. We often use the term bioethics. Um, it is a misnomer. Um, it is not used properly by even a lot of people in the field. Um, bioethics is, a, is a, the umbrella term um, that applies to, uh, describes applied ethics. Um, but there are three primary sub-disciplines within bioethics um, that um, will help us kind of focus on this. The first and most common is medical ethics, and really what we're going to talk about in this course is medical ethics. Um, all of us, including myself, slip into saying bioethics occasionally, uh, but that is uh, broader than what our conversation will be. Um, there's also animal ethics uh, within the umbrella of bioethics. Um, how should we ethically treat animals? Um, you know, and that doesn't always mean that we're uh, you know, card-carrying members of PETA, um, but it is, you know, how should we, uh, what respect should we give to them? Um, how should we interact with them? Uh, those sorts of things. And last but not least is environmental ethics falls within the umbrella of bioethics. Um, how should we treat the uh, earth? Um, and how do we balance our needs with um, the natural resources um, and future generations and so forth? Um, all of those are within the concept of bioethics. So off my soapbox and moving on, let's talk about medical ethics. Um, this emerged as kind of an academic um, field uh, late in the 20th century. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the 1970s, John Rawls was starting to write about things. Um, the, uh, when I was in uh, studying in the 1980s, we still didn't have really good names for a lot of the things we talk about today. Uh, we called it medical jurisprudence. Uh, somewhat because we were lawyers looking at it, um, but uh, it, it did start to emerge. Um, and it was a reaction to a lot of negative events that had occurred um, in the middle, early and middle uh, 20th century. Um, there was the human experimentation issues uh, with the, in Germany, um, in Japan, um, in China, um, and in our own country, uh, in Tuskegee, uh, where syphilis studies were, were carried out. Um, the governmental response to this was to enact a number of uh, declarations or codes. Um, first, first and well known of them was the Nuremberg Code, which resulted from World War II and the atrocities um, in, in that war. Next was the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, coming out in 1964, again primarily focused on human experimentation. Um, and more recently, the Belmont Report, which was issued uh, in, in the United States, um, again, there's a very much a declaration of uh, human autonomy, of fundamental uh, personal rights um, in the U.S. Academic centers started to emerge um, to study uh, medical ethics. Um, the, one of the first ones was the uh, Institute of Society Ethics and the Life Sciences, uh, which is now known as the Hastings Center, uh, still going full, full tilt um, and a very well-respected institution. Um, there's also the Kennedy Center for the Study of Human Reproduction and Bioethics, uh, started shortly thereafter in Boston. Um, both of these centers have produced uh, tremendous amounts of uh, work in this area. It was expanded, the concept of medical ethics as a discipline was expanded to every hospital by our friends at JACO in 1992. Um, it's now, they not, now like to call themselves the Commission. Um, regardless, um, they require that every institution uh, has a a ethics committee or a way of addressing ethics within the hospital. Um, in the mid late 1970s, uh, Tom Beauchamp and James uh, Childress um, started publishing their work. Um, Professor Childress is at the University of Virginia, Tom Beauchamp's at Georgetown, so we have kind of a local connection to them. Um, and they uh, were very big proponents of looking at how how do we manage uh, ethical issues within um, providing health care? They came up with what uh, they described as the four principles approach, and it has caught on. Uh, it is probably the most popular in the uh, amongst ethics committees and in uh, ethical discussions in, in healthcare these days. Um, some call it principalism um, for a shorthand. And these are the four uh, principles that they described that they can claim that were universal. 
the first was autonomy, uh, which is, uh, as we reflect back, that really has to do with the um, concept of uh, patient rights, um, non -mal uh, which is to do no harm, and beneficence, which is to uh, benefit your patient, and justice, uh, which is the fairness concept we've talked about before. They came up with this uh, sort of definition. Um, it is a bit awkward, I would, I would share, um, but it, it tries to get to the idea of we can figure out um, how to interact with each other. So let's look at the basic elements of principalism. Uh, first is personal autonomy. Next is beneficence, non malfeasance and justice. And we'll look at each of those in more detail. First is personal autonomy. Um, and we've talked about this under deontology. Um, this is the right of every patient to make decisions for themselves, um, to know the facts, and to not be coerced into making that decision. Uh, very popular, very much a strong uh, driver in healthcare as we know it today in the United States. The second is beneficence. Um, this is the effort to uh, uh, help your patient, um, i.e. do good. Um, and on the flip side, of course, is the duty to not hurt the patient, non malfeasance um, avoid harm, do no harm, as one would say in the Hippocratic Oath, um, which is certainly a laudable goal uh, for any healthcare provider. The fourth concept is fairness to others. And you will recall, um, as we, you reflect back on the prior uh, PowerPoints, um, this is the concept of equal um, equals being treated equally, unequals being treated unequally, um, and also uh, looking at precedent on the casuistry. Um, you know, how do we fairly treat all the people who are involved in this ethical uh, decision? Here's a diagram that I've uh, created for better or for worse to help you uh, better understand the tension that these four principles are under in the balancing that, that you uh, will have to undertake. Um, for example, the first is um, the uh, benefit of the patient. Uh, the goal, of course, is to, uh, in providing health care, is to help the patient. On the flip side, we don't want to hurt the patient. Unfortunately, as there are occasions where uh, we will have to hurt the patient in order to benefit the patient. Uh, for example, if we do surgery in the short term, that's going to be quite painful uh, in some circumstances. Um, but the long term goal is to benefit the patient. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes in an effort to benefit the patient, we actually harm the patient. Um, you know, radiation treatment is, is intended to benefit the patient, um, but it, on occasions um, it may actually harm the patient by causing uh, further injury to the patient. Likewise, we have the concept of autonomy, uh, the patient's right to be as free and, and individualistic as they want to be, the right to um, know what procedure is going to be performed, be told the truth, um, and to freely make a decision to have treatment. On the converse side of that is justice of what is good for the community, um, what is fair to all people um, in the um, stakeholders in the decision. If we look at uh, autonomy, um, a patient may refuse care and in that circumstance um, may harm the community. For example, a patient may decline uh, mental health care, but uh, that puts the community at risk um, if they have violent tendencies or may harm uh, themselves. So these are always uh, four different values that one has to uh, balance together in, in making their decisions uh, in this circumstance. Now let's look further at principalism um, and the criticism of, of principalism. Um, and I, I am a uh, proponent that there are a lot of criticisms of this approach um, in that it um, overemphasizes um, autonomy uh, considerably. Um, it gives us really no um, ethical guidance um, as to how we should be resolving cases. It merely gives us four different principles um, and we um, you know, figure out from there. It certainly allows for the bias of the community of the decision maker uh, to come in uh, because there are, there's no uh, priority amongst those four principles. Um, they're all just kind of out there floating in equilibrium. Um, 
and some critics suggest that it's kind of merely a checklist. Uh, we look at this, we look at that, we look at uh, something else. Um, and it really doesn't give you a methodology uh, of how you go about making decisions. It also uh, uh, is pointed out that it's uh, flawed uh, because it's so nonspecific. Um, it simply kind of tells the ethics committee, hey, um, you ought to be looking at these four factors. Um, but it doesn't give any guidance as to uh, any one particular one, uh, except for probably uh, individual autonomy, uh, which if we believe that is um, the way that we want to go, then why don't we just acknowledge the ontology and run with it? Um, it doesn't distinguish between different types of ethics. Um, are we talking the common good? Are we talking um, utilitarianism? Um, are we talking uh, deontology? Um, in making these decisions. But it also doesn't take into account uh, the, the many different factors um, uh, as far as well-being, which is something we've not really talked much about in these ethical decisions. Um, for a patient, there's the organic, i.e. the physical uh, well-being to be considered. There's the psychological well-being to consider, be considered. There's social situation uh, as well as the community. Um, the economic dis situation, which in the United States is a tremendous issue, um, the leading cause of bankruptcies amongst individuals is our health care bills. Um, there is um, the religious issue uh, to consider, uh, where this patient and their family comes uh, or relies on in their uh, religious uh, foundation. There's the aesthetic, um, you know, what is important to the to the patient. There is the legal, of course, of you know, what laws do we have in place and do we consider. And then there, of course, is whatever is unique uh, to the patient or the other situation that's being considered. These factors aren't really uh, dealt with at all uh, in, within the principalism. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, often they are overlooked in many of the other ethics approaches that we consider. Going back to our principalism, though, since that's our topic at hand, um, it, uh, I would suggest to you that uh, the uh, Beauchamp and Childress model simply kind of gives us a framework, uh, uh, facilitates the discussion uh, for uh, health healthcare providers, for ethics committees uh, to make these decisions. Um, it does not really give us a, a whole lot of guidance. Um, there is a, a, a ethicist by the name of Meffin. Um, in 2008 came out with a matrix of how one would uh, balance um, these things and that, that may be actually of more benefit to us as we as we move forward uh, because principalism and the other things that we have really don't fit with our spreadsheet culture these days. Um, we really um, beg for that cost-benefit analysis sort of approach. Uh, you know, uh, we want a black and white yes or no in these very complex ethical decisions that we'll be talking about throughout the uh, remainder of the course. Um, and uh, Mepham may have been the, the guy um, who uh, gave us what uh, modern America is looking for is, you know, how do we plug it in? How do we weight each of the factors and, and therefore arrive at a decision? With that in mind, um, that uh, is the end of our uh, PowerPoints on the approaches to ethics. Uh, we will try to um, include uh, ethical considerations in all of our uh, future conversations. The, uh, you know, sometimes we continue to get bogged down in the idea that what is ethical is what is legal. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll hope to hopefully remind ourselves um, to look a little further than just to, as to what the law is.